So hi everybody, I'm Melody and welcome to Go Inspire. And today we're welcoming Shisomo Firi. Hi Shisomo. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. You wrote an amazing article on intersectional feminism on our platform. And I thought, you know, I have to interview you to get to know you more and for you to explain a bit more about uh, this subject, which I feel is so relevant today. So you are 24 years old. You already have an amazing journey. You, you have occupied several positions in representation and you, you already run a couple of powerful campaigns to fight for equality. So congratulations on that, really. I would love to know a bit more about you and I'm sure the audience would love to as well. So do you want to tell us a bit about your journey? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Those are really, really kind words. Um, I went to university at Swansea, Swansea University, and I studied public relations and media studies and really, really enjoyed my time there. It's just, yeah, one of the best university experiences. So I was president of the Students Union for a year. And then after that, I was women's officer at the National Union of Students Wales, which is another amazing opportunity. I ran a campaign to end period poverty in Wales. Um, obviously, period poverty is often kind of described as women um, and those pe and people who menstruate um, not being able to afford sanitary products. But you know, period poverty really goes deeper. It's about education and for people to really understand about their bodies and how menstruation impacts them and just positive education on it because I don't know about you but when I was growing up and I think even still now it's a massive taboo and I thought it was really important for people who menstruate to understand that you know it's not something to be ashamed of and um, it's something that is quite empowering the premise of the campaign was I created a toolkit for students unions to use and other activists to use to campaign for this issue on their campus and in their spaces. I wrote to um, every member um, of the Senate, the Senate is the Welsh Parliament, um, about this issue. I sent them a glittery tampon in the post, which oh. I think they quite liked to receive in. Um, <laughs> in the end, it wasn't just my work. It was a real collection of activists in Wales. Um, but yeah, the campaign was successful and the Welsh government pledged £3.3 .3 million for the free sanitary products to be made available for schools in Wales and then went further to offer that to colleges as well, which was amazing. Um, but obviously, you know, the fight still continues. Um, it's still a massive taboo in our society. And realistically, what we want is for everyone, whether you're in education or not, to be able to to have access to free sanitary products. Now I'm back working for a gender equality charity in Wales called Quara Tag, which means fair play in Welsh. And it's the leading gender equality um, charity in Wales. And we do a, a whole host of things. We work with employers um, and businesses, ensuring that they, they have best practices across the board when it comes to gender equality in the workplace. We influence and campaign around policies within Welsh government. I absolutely love what I do. I wish that I didn't have to do it because I wish that we lived in a gender equal society, but I love what I do and I'm, yeah, happy to be part of something bigger. Yeah, and it's, I, feel, I feel like it's great that you, you're taking on those responsibilities and you taking action and you're not afraid to speak up. And I wanted to ask you when it comes to that really is, what, what has been your experience as a young black woman in positions or leadership? When I first entered the role as president, I'd go into meetings and people would assume that my white male colleagues were the was the president and I wasn't. Um, I remember being in a meeting once where someone kind of said, you know, it was another white person that said, oh, you know, you've certainly shattered some glass ceilings, which... I think was meant to be a compliment. I don't doubt that it was probably well intended, but it's another way of kind of saying people that look like you don't normally get these positions. That is seen, you know, where whiteness and being a male is the norm, is seen as being a leader. You know, we need to really break down those barriers, not just for black women, but for everyone. You know, being a leader really isn't about yourself, it's about empowering others. Um, and I think that's something that the narrative that really needs to be changed around leadership. You know, there have been occasions where I'd have to raise my voice to just be heard. And 
I'm not a shouty person. I, I, you know, the, that's just not a way to communicate. But those are the situations that I found myself in as well. Like I'd have staff members kind of label me as rude um, where I think if a man had said what I had said or, or another white woman had said what I said, they'd be labelled as assertive. Yeah, I've had to really feel like I've had to prove myself. 10 times more than anyone else would have to do you know and as much as those experiences have been difficult and I felt in that position I was constantly taking knives out of my back every single day um I wouldn't change them because they've really made who I am and now I'm equipped with the skills um that I need to empower other women that is what it's all about it's about empowering the next generation of female leaders no matter what they look like, no matter their background, creating a collective movement that all want to have the same outcome. There is a narrative around struggling and around be the only one, and being, but especially for Black women, you are seen as a strong person, as if you don't have you know, weaknesses, as, as if you don't have fear, as if, as if struggle is something that you are supposed to go through. I mean, we all go, go through struggle, but it's almost like, telling you okay you're strong it's amazing it's like it's cool but like not realizing that it's, you, you have to be strong because there is injustice and there is unfairness mm. it's almost like you've put on the pedestal because of an inequality kind of yeah yeah definitely and that's something that I really try to drum into people to understand because it's not actually really a compliment um it's time to have a conversation around that word strong and what it really means and where it comes from you know the reason why black women are always labeled as strong is because when we were enslaved, you know, we were not seen as humans. We had medical performances made on us that were really harmful. And there was this narrative that black women don't feel pain. So it was OK to test all these medical trials on them left, right and center, which made a lot of people die. And there was a lot of pain from that. And you know, that is where that narrative comes from. You know, I think a lot of people might watch this and be like, oh gosh, you can't say anything nowadays. And it's not about being politically correct. It's about understanding where language comes from and where these narratives come from. They come from a deep, dark past of slaves, enslavement and power structures that were created to put black people down. So how do you feel about the representation of Black women in media or in politics or in general? I, when I was younger, I always really struggled to find, um, you know, Black women to aspire to. But you know, look at the way that Serena Williams is um, displayed in the media. You know, after the, she had that match in the French Open, there was that French, you know, caricature of her that was just really animalistic, you know. Yeah. She was seen as like a beast. She had a rattle that she'd thrown down. Her hair was all like wired and everything. And these type of images and narratives are not there by chance. They are there from deeply racist narrative that society still has about black women. You know, we are seen as loud, angry, animalistic. We're seen as less than, you know, whiteness is the norm whiteness is the ideal and if you're not that in a society then you are kind of cast to the side and the media does really play on those stereotypes and narratives I think on that um one thing that I've always really admired about the black women that I look up to like Dawn Butler, Diane Abbott, Serena Williams, many others black women are unapologetically themselves and that is the advice that I would give to any young black woman that you know looks at these stereotypes and feels disheartened is yeah. just be unapologetically yourself because that is the only way you can get along in life yeah you wrote an amazing article for us on intersectional feminism and i wanted to ask you for, for our audience what is intersectional feminism because that's a term that seems to be so modern but actually it's a concept that's been thought about during the early 90s actually so it's, it's not new how does it differ from regular feminism intersectionality like you said yeah it is a term that has been thrown around a lot recently but has been around for a long time it was first coined in 1989 by lawyer and activist kimberly crenshaw who 
kind of needed to find a term to describe the discrimination that black women were facing. Um, in a court of law at the time, you could only um, advocate for your discrimination, whether it was sexism or racism, it couldn't be both. And black women were finding that they were having a lot of discrimination in the workplace, but kind of had to pick a discrimination. It was either sexism or racism. And in, and in that time, sexism was seen as an issue solely for white women and racism was seen as an issue so, solely for black, women, for black men even. So therefore black women were left out of the conversation and their experiences were left out of the fight for equality um, completely. So that is why the term was kind of coined to kind of talk about the way that people's identities and differences intersect with one another, creating exacerbated forms of oppression in modern society. We know that intersectionality isn't just about black women, it's about you know, disabled women, trans women, bisexual women, lesbian women, you know, everyone. It's about understanding that, that people are different. We live different lives and the differences intertwine with one another and can create different forms of oppression. And it's only by understanding those differences that we are able to fight against those inequalities. And that is what it's all about. You know, feminism has developed and it has um, adopted over the years. You know, we talk about the first wave, second wave and that kind of thing. And I think in a lot of conversations, even still now, it is still seen as a white woman's issue. But we need to understand that what we want to achieve by feminism is equality. And it's often seen as a fight for just women, but actually true intersexual feminism is the foundation of social justice and social equity, which liberates everyone. Yeah. What would be your advice for young women uh, who aspire to build a career in public relation or representation? My advice would be um, to build your networks. Um, any networking opportunity that there is, absolutely take it. I have built my career from networking. Um, and a lot of the time, the opportunities that I've been given is are from someone that I know has said, oh, this has come up, or, you know, you'd be really good at this, X, Y, Z. And it's not just about career opportunities, but it's having that support system as well. Actively seek out mentors um, in the field that you want to have. I've really benefited from having mentors who have kind of given me that career advice, but also just that, just to be there if you want to have a rant or a cry or anything, um, definitely seek out a mentor. And as well in terms of representation and maybe campaigning and advocating is to really find what you're passionate about um, find what makes you tick find what makes you angry like for me absolutely what makes me angry is that we do not have gender equality in this world and then obviously the fact that feminism is not always intersectional um, and that our society still does not understand the ways that different characteristics, um, age, gender, you know, sexuality, class, ability, disability, you know, intersect with one another and create exacerbated forms of oppression. That is something that I'm really passionate about and that I really ran with. And so, yeah, my advice is to find something you're passionate about and run with it because that will keep you going. When you have days that you don't want to get up in the morning, days where you want to quit, having that passion will get you out of bed um, and it will stay with you. And as well, like I said earlier, just be authentically yourself. No one is you. That is your superpower. That is your absolute superpower. You know, we are not made to be the same. And those things that help you to stand out will really help you to go far in life. So thank you really for that. Thank you for all of your insights and sharing with us um, everything for being vulnerable as well because you shared some things that are quite you know, personal to you. So thank you for that. No, thank you so much for having me and thank you for your platform. It's really amazing and inspiring and I'm so happy you asked me to come and share. And yeah, I hope that it's been insightful and useful.